All right. So welcome, everyone, and good morning. Um, happy to be here moderating this panel. We have uh, five innovative CEOs here who are doing some interesting things around application development and helping companies kind of overcome that app gap that uh, Jack Gold so eloquently laid out yesterday. And it's a, it's a real thing. We see it in our research. Uh, companies are certainly struggling with the app dev function. They don't have the skill sets that they need um, to develop applications efficiently in a cost-effective manner. So I think that's where these guys come in. They've done some good work in developing a platform or tools. And then we have Daniel here from Aetherpal, who's not in the app dev space, but has an interesting story to share for sure. So I think a good way to start is to talk about, you know, how are you helping companies kind of make progress in digital transformation? That's what this kind of discussion will start with, and then we'll kind of go into the intricacies and difficult, you know, difficulties you're helping companies uh, overcome. So start with Kia at the end there. Yes, Kia Benia, I'm with Powwow. So digital transformation for me is, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, working with customers, falls into two categories. One is, how do we make them deliver better services to their customers? Uh, examples of that, uh, particularly one that's life and death is healthcare. We'll be sharing a use case later on today uh, where we transformed uh, hospital medicine delivery uh, using uh, tablet and barcode uh, scanning so that you can ensure from the minute the patient checks in with a wristband uh, that they're the right p patient, they're getting the right drugs, so the drugs are also scanned, and uh, that lowers any error rates, and it really transforms the experience, uh, particularly in, in, in an area that, that is uh, desperately under scrutiny from a cost and uh, service delivery perspective. The second uh, part of digital transformation has to do with making employees productive. And I think there's lots of, uh, that's a target rich in environment. Uh, what we found is some of our clients have done some analysis of where are the bottlenecks in their company where they can move a needle uh, greatly. One simple example of this is automating approvals across your enterprise. We had a client uh, in the telecom field that did analysis on how long it takes for decisions to be made and uh, be officialized through an approval process and they had four layers of management, and for many everyday tasks, it would take more than two weeks to get that chain to actually do approvals. So building a straightforward application that consolidates all these approvals, uh, nets in that company making decisions faster than being able to. So to me, those are examples of digital transformation. Uh, take care of your customers in a new revolutionary way, yep. take care of your employees, make them productive, and make them more competitive. Neha, take yeah. a stab. Sure, good morning. I'm Neha Sampat with Built.io. Um, so, you know, I'm one of the co-founders of the company. Uh, my CTO, who's the other co-founder, we were both in large enterprise organizations 10 years ago where we saw that there was sort of this tug of war happening between the business side and, and the uh, IT and the technical side. And we didn't necessarily see eye to eye. And what we saw is that instead of, instead of innovation happening, innovation was really slowing. And so we started Built.io essentially to help large organizations like those to be more innovative. And um, essentially for me, digital transformation is taking old systems and new systems and starting to figure out where they, where they can work together. And so we, um, for us, digital transformation comes from three different areas. Essentially being able to integrate systems together. So we have an integration platform that lets you do that. Um, Embracing mobility, so we have a mobile backend as a service and accelerating um, mobile development and just application development in general. And then bringing all the content together and be, being able to have an omni-channel strategy around that. So digital transformation is really bringing all of those things together and then embracing your employees' needs to be more innovative where, and still kind of maintaining the standards that you care about as a company. Excellent. John? So um, I'm John Derrick, <coughs> CEO of Appery, and really what we have seen is um, if you think about all the mobile apps or the desires for mobile apps that you may have in your organization, oftentimes many of them are too complex, too difficult to even try out. You know, you have to do this priority list, which is going to get worked on, which is going to get approved. And, and, you know, there's people that do rapid development environments, right? There's people that do integration and all these different things to kind of help it work. Uh, but what we basically focused on, and I think is what's going to transition as we go into 2017 and beyond, is people are going to want a point of solution, right, where they can go, they can build something rapid, 
And if that seems to take off, then they can continue to extend. Small and, wins. And augment it, right. And, and really be agile in that process and kind of take their customer feedback. Um, and because of that, we've had, you know, we have thousands of customers, but many of them, you know, they start out very small and then it bubbles up through the organization and becomes an interesting app and then it kind of gets more mass adoption. So we also have enterprise customers and healthcare, you know, finance, stuff like that. But I think the, the biggest challenge is now that we've gone through the first phase of mobile, everyone's like, wait a minute, what, do we, what have we done, right? <laughs> you know, because, you know, all of a sudden people are going to have to try to rein that back in and kind of understand how to manage it and how to deal with it. And I think that's where people like us, you know, need to be providing the technologies to really make it work. Right, get in, get started, be able to extend and continue to build, you know, without breaking your systems and your employees, you know, will to live. Like it, Jamie, chime in. So uh, I'm one of the co-founders at Apivo, and uh, similar to some of the other comments, uh, really came out of the you know, looking at uh, people trying to embrace new technologies, looking at. Uh, people getting wound, wound up around the axle is a lot of the challenges of, of getting there and dealing with all of the, the new technologies that are coming out kind of being thrown at us left and right. Um, who wants to get into a cloud argument and definition you know, discussion, right? That's, that's been done a million times, but it's still being hashed out. So uh, at Apivo, we really want people to stop creating new legacy applications um, and, and try to simplify the, the app dev pro process to where it's more of an app build process. So really enable people to uh, get out there and start building applications, mobile or web applications, do it in a, in a simple, quick way so they can get the ideas out of their head and uh, into the browser or onto their phone quickly. Really lower the, the barrier to innovation. No, those are great points. I think, you know, we're going to talk a lot more about legacy applications a little bit further on in our discussion here, and I think that's a really uh, important point that you just made. Daniel, real quick, tell us about AetherPal and the, the, uh, what you're offering to the market, because I think it's a little different from the rest of the panel here. Great. Thank you. Daniel Dini, CEO of AetherPal. What we're focused on is mobile support management uh, for the end user. So how do we transform the mobile support experience uh, for a user-centric uh, model? Uh, that creates a real-time experience, as well as reducing IT support costs. So if you take a look at the enterprise mobility lifecycle, it started years ago with deploying devices, smartphones and tablets, to folks in the, the field, sales and service and support people. Then application development started accelerating beyond email calendar and contacts. Uh, so line of business applications, productivity, third-party applications are now starting to get mobilized through this mobile transformation that we're all seeing at various levels within the organizations. Then security sort of comes into play at various levels. We talked a lot about that yesterday on the panels. So for us, to complete that life cycle, uh, we're focused really on the support piece. And support's quickly becoming a huge challenge for operations and help desk um, and service desk uh, personnel. So we're transforming that around the end user, and we'll talk a bit more about what we're doing there to innovate. Okay, so I'm going to go right back to you, Daniel, because I think that's you know, a differentiated uh, solution in the market right now. I think a lot of folks rely on um, the help desk function quite a bit, but I think, you know, as as we've heard over the last couple of days, a lot of people are still stuck on email, right? Our data shows that I'm sure, you know, many businesses have a thousand apps, but when I say many businesses, you know, it's a, it's a handful, maybe a couple handfuls. Um, you know, companies are moving quickly, but a lot of companies are still stuck on email, right? So I think what's interesting about it for me is, you know, the support function will become even more critical once these business critical or mission critical apps continue to make their way into the enterprise, right? The high value apps that companies don't necessarily know they need, but are starting to realize that they can implement and, and, and develop. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's really what I see happening is, you know, the more apps become, you know, more critical to the business, the more the elevated the support function will be. Um, so, so how, you know, how can you actually really help, a, you know, an end user who's stuck um, in real time with a self-service element. Is that something that you're pursuing? Yes, uh, so, so let's talk about a use case. So we've been working with uh, a large financial services company to design uh, our new application we call Valet, which is end user support. And uh, the challenge was that this um, large financial services company had an auto finance division where they've deployed uh, line of business and productivity applications to thousands of salespeople. So this is all about loan underwriting volume, those types of things. Um, and 
the salespeople need to use these loan underwriting apps daily to do their jobs. So it's not just merely getting information. It's to, to write new loans. It's to service and support existing uh, car dealers in certain areas with the auto finance division. So it became mission critical. And uh, what was interesting was that the nature of the help desk uh, was beginning to change as a result of these mission critical business apps. So the help desk was now becoming the first um, sort of line of defense to, to really field questions like, how do I uh, use this app? How do I configure it? How do I run a report within the app? I think I have this app issue, this app problem. So these level one help desks are really not set up to um, really handle those types of requests. And certainly budgets are, are tight there, um, as it is, as we know. So you know, this financial service company really wanted to flip this around and really drive end user self-service. So how do you create more of a real-time experience? Uh, because with mobile, you, know, you can't just call the help desk, wait 24 to 48 hours to have your problem solved. In the PC desktop world, that was perfectly acceptable and still is. But for mobile, it's real time. So this was the nature of the problem. And we worked to collaborate with uh, this um, company last year. And we've now launched this product in the market um, on a use case that we feel is applicable to a, a broad range of industries around mobile support. So you know, as you think about going beyond email, calendar, and contacts, developing your first productivity apps, or deploying Salesforce or SAP, those kinds of apps, the nature of the support model will start to change. The help desk will start to feel the pressure around these level one calls, which are more FAQ-like in nature. And that's where we've seen uh, self-service and end user support really um, come in in a, in a big strategic way. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear from you guys, you know, up and down actually. You know, what's really the trigger event when you guys approach customers? I'm assuming, you know, you guys are all innovating, your startups are moving quickly. You have to engage in a lot of direct sales. You probably don't have extremely well-developed channels. You're relatively young companies. Um, so you probably get involved in a lot of these deals. What's the trigger event you're seeing that's getting companies to say, all right, I really do need some help here. I'm willing to invest in this and I, and I want to, you know, I want to do better in terms of helping my company with applications and adopting applications. So I think uh, for majority of our customers, it's not their first rodeo when it comes to mobile. And uh, uh, they, they know the pain of the first couple of apps that they had to do, the challenges organizationally. Sure. Uh, and, and just like all decisions around technology, uh, when you're bringing something that's very disruptive into the org, like mobility, you have to worry about people, process, and technology. And uh, it requires vendors, uh, small or big, to be very transparent and open about their capabilities, what application types they can address, what application types they can address, use cases and uh, are critical. Uh, that's, I think, we'd love to actually get to a meeting where very quickly we're talking about the specific use cases. Uh, so that you can vet out, uh, you know, kind of the, the pain required organizationally, the adoption model, their perspective. But the trigger point usually is a realization that you can't take the previous approach and apply it to the next 150 apps in the org. Right. And so increasingly we're seeing organizations that want an enterprise-wide strategy. They look at a portfolio of applications. They're identifying which applications are legacy and not important. What, which applications are strategic and needs to need to be modernized. Increasingly, we're not even talking about mobile, we're talking about mobile or new experiences, modern experiences, uh, because quite frankly, nobody has the IT budget to go and rewrite all those apps uh, from scratch and, and right. you know, nor the time. Right. Yeah, I mean, to, to add to that, um, you know, digital transformation is not a point in time, it's a journey, and and sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming to say I'm going to do all of this at once and you know what I like to think about is you know we talk about microservices as an approach to building applications and tying your systems together in a similar way on the business side I like to think about micro innovation and you know tie, picking a few things you know not not trying to take everything all at once and build rebuild all your applications but choosing a couple basic things that you want to fix and building out a proof of concept and using that as a tool to then go and get more people to support what you're trying to do inside your organization is what we typically um, ask our customers to do. And so the trigger point for me is identifying a few small wins so you can get those across the line and then help your, help your organization to realize the value and then advance your journey from there. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think for us, you know, the, the realization light bulb 
comes on for the customer um, when they start getting into the def defining that Omni app, that thing that they thought was going to be mobile, it was going to do all the different workflows and things that they were doing on a desktop or you know laptop before, um, and they realize that the usage model is different. Right, you know, mobile app, the thing that's really valuable about it is if you're the guy climbing the pole to do service in a utility, there's only a few things you care about and you want an app where you can go check, 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 or you're done. You know, yeah. if you're someone else in the supply, you know, back supply room in a hospital or doing healthcare stuff, it's an entirely different flow. Um, and, and so that realization that all of that enterprise data that they already have available, um, that they need to be able to connect to it securely create new APIs, even put logic, you know, workflow logic back in the cloud, um, and then securely connect that to their endpoints. That's the realization when it's like, hey, I don't have a mobile, you know, app problem I'm developing. I have a whole mobile app strategy problem and portfolio I need to build, right? And so then the question is, how do I do that effectively? How do I do it in a rapid turnaround? And that's really where the, you know, for us, a lot of times it's, hey, I can build something that works right away. It's not pretty, but all the functionality is there. And once that is kind of something that gets an uptake in the, in the system, that's when they kind of will polish it. And eventually it will become, a, sometimes it will become a B to C, not a B to E. You know, type application will get extended and actually get pushed out to, you know, patients in a hospital or, you know, finance people. So from, from our perspective, I see that a lot of the customers that we talk with are they see the, the app backlog. Uh, mm -hmm. They see it growing, uh, or if it's not there, they see it on the horizon. And like a lot of things, it's, it's driven by kind of a relentless force of consumerization pressure. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of requests coming in from line of business, and you know, it's, not a, it's not a question of really saying no. Uh, because of consumerization, uh, people have an option of shadow IT, which is kind of a, a scary thought. And so how do we, how do we enable them to handle uh, this onslaught of requests for applications? And certainly, not all of them are going to be fantastic ideas, and maybe they don't all deserve to be apps. But you know, coming from, whether it's coming from marketing or sales or a field services team or whoever it is, uh, there's probably a lot of value to that request. Maybe not exactly what's being requested, but you know, it's, it's indicative of a, of a challenge and therefore an opportunity um, to really provide some productivity back into the business. Um, and yeah. so I think the, you know, a lot of what we see here, it's, it's being driven by, by those types of needs. Um, and so it's just a matter of you know, how do we enable people to take action on that quickly without having to spin up a kind of traditional massive project that's going to take months and go over budget and be overdeveloped and over-engineered. Yeah, so, so I think to that point, you know, app development can be very costly, right? I mean, we have statistics on it. Other firms that uh, look at these markets have statistics on it. Apps can take a long time to develop. Apps can be you know, extremely expensive. A lot of collaboration is required. And what I see happening in the market is you know, taking you know, companies like yours are creating tools that are really just hiding the complexity and really democratizing application development to a much wider audience that isn't really someone who knows C Sharp or, or any other you know, programming language, right? You're giving them tools that can really help them make quick progress, develop applications, and it's not a simple application necessarily, and that's what I think is very compelling about it, and I think what a lot of people don't understand. There's, you know, we're, we're talking about sophisticated back-end connected applications that can operate in offline mode and do very sophisticated things for a company. Let's talk a little bit about that. I think that's really where the rubber meets the road. This isn't, you talked about approvals. I know you can do much more with your platform yeah. than just approvals. And I know Built.io does a lot more than just basic approvals, and I'm sure, you know, Pivo and Apari yeah. also. So I'd like to talk about the more sophisticated use cases, you know, working with complex backends, SAP, Oracle, mm -hmm. PeopleSoft, all these systems. So I think complexity comes from three different dimensions. One is the data sources and the secure access that is required around systems of record. Second is around the, what some call the systems of engagement. The, user experience, the social capability, what, what makes these applications different than static old uh, applications. Uh, and then the third, which is very important as well, is how do you provide a platform that manages the experience uh, as we move to this digital transformation era and IoT era with multiple devices? So we've built a set of capabilities. In fact, we're, we're launching one uh, today at Citrix, uh, the, at the Citrix conference called Smart Roaming. 
And this came across from working with some of our financial services customers, particularly in the B2B side, where they wanted a uh, loan officer uh, around the commercial business to be able to start a loan while playing golf with the CFO as he hears a need for a line of credit, have somebody else in the office on a completely different device take the beginning part of that loan and complete the next set of records, and then for, <clears throat> sorry, for the loan officer to be able to pick up where they left off using a completely different device. So this is uh, session mobility across platforms in context of a business application. Now, if you're an Apple fan and you use FaceTime and iPhoto and all their apps, they, all their apps do this today. And all, I think the consumer is starting to expect that these mobile devices, particularly if they have uh, you know, multiples of them, need to understand the context and presence and be able to hand the baton. That's an example of a very sophisticated use case uh, that I think is going to be table stakes in two years. You know, every application that runs on a device, particularly in a world where people have wearables, a tablet, and a phone, are going to need to behave in this way. Completely changes the paradigm from majority of the applications we wrote. And that's, uh, that, that's an example of where you need to go beyond uh, just developing an app that just connects to one backend. So this, this multiple uh, capabilities of taking these workflows making them digital and automating the business process is something uh, that, that, that we're continuing to see in, in different industries. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty progressive stuff, right? We're, yeah. we're talking about, you know, for lack of better terms, you know, a mashup of data from disparate mm -hmm. uh, data stores. Um, very powerful. Neha, any, any comments? Because I know you guys definitely get involved in a lot of infrastructure as a service and some pretty complex stuff yourselves. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, people talk a lot about the Internet of Things, IoT, and, and it feels kind of scary in, in, in a lot of organizations, something that doesn't feel relevant. Um, we don't actually like to say Internet of Things. We like to think about it as the Internet of APIs. And so APIs is the common language that lets legacy systems and new systems and all of these different microservices um, not become disparate and actually start to talk to each other. And so for, for me, you know, the addressing a, a sophisticated problem or a simple problem starts with understanding what are the integration points. And if you're looking at um, big data on old systems and you're looking at trying to incorporate all these cloud-based services, it all starts at architecting how they'll talk to each other. And so one of my favorite use cases that we're currently engaged in is, um, is the Sacramento Kings. It's an NBA team, mm -hmm. not a typical um, organization, but it's, it's really interesting because it's actually very complex to deliver a fan experience that is end-to-end, -end, seamless to the end user, but there's a lot going on in the back end. And if you think about what they're doing, so the Sacramento Kings is a, you know, building out a brand new arena. They're billing it to be the most connected building on the planet. They've made heavy investment in the infrastructure behind the connectivity, so when fans are actually in the arena, they'll have constant connectivity, and we're building the technology experience around all of that. So what that means is you have the state-dependent awareness, right? So is it a game day, is it not a game day? Is the person near the arena or not near the arena? Are they watching from home, or are they actually approaching the arena 25 minutes before the game? Um, you've got ticket list entry and you have the, the ability to pre-order and have your favorite drink waiting for you when you show up in your VIP suite and the ability to s interact with other fans or with players and social media and my, you know all these different microservices that are delivering this great fan experience but you have the ability to say okay I've got 50 microservices and now there's a better vendor for in-seat ordering I don't have to rebuild the application. I don't have to think about how am I going to make this work with the back end. You can pull out that in-seat ordering API and add another one, and it's seamless to the end user. And that's, that's sort of what I see happening in terms of transformation is, is you don't have to make the back end so complex as long as you have the integrations that exist to the systems of record. Everything else is about innovation, flexibility, and making changes as you go, and, and starting to think that way when you're building applications. Great. Yeah, I, I think I think the connectivity to data and services is key, right? Because you know you're not you're running a mobile app unless it's a game, and even that you may be connecting a lot of other things. Um, but what you really care about is you know that kind of data, you know, going out and looking at all the different data. So even though you know our platform, you can just sit down and you know in a UI kind of drag drop, choose what you want to have happen. Um, at some point, you're going to connect to data, and when you do that, you know 
you need to have a tool that you can create a, an effective, in this case, you know, you point to the thing, it self-discovers what data is available. You can kind of map it across. And then you can add a lot of code, a lot of logic. And so the key thing, I think, in, for us, the more complex cases that we've seen, um, you know, it started out as a pretty simple, you know, basic flow. Um, and then um, immense, I'll say immense amounts of JavaScript and Java server code, depending on the, on the user, um, they were able to build that in and embed it within that same construct, that same flow. And, and so there's really not a limit to the extensibility. Um, and I think that's what happens. A lot of times someone builds an app, they say, hey, I'd love this app. They build it, and then they realize, hey, wait a minute, there's a lot more data here, or there's a lot of massaging to data I need to create. Um, and so if you can create a framework where they can do that, and create a framework where they can start sharing and publishing um, those APIs so that other very specific use case um, apps can be created, um, you create a lot of value for the customer, and then they can really start expanding their use. And that, for us, that's been in healthcare, it's been in financial services, um, it's been in logistics. You know, people that, as a, as a truck is approaching, you know, the delivery point, you know, the customer gets an alert, hey, your building materials are close by, and the, and the driver, you know, does a handoff, and at that point it goes back in the ERP systems or, you know, whatever. Right, and that's all a you know, cloud-based thing, so it doesn't matter which device you're talking to, everyone's got a consistent view, and it's all kind of an automated flow. And you know, that's where mobile devices really shine, because you, know, you know where you are, you know who you are, right, because it's in your pocket, um, and all the authentication and stuff can be extended. Excellent. Jamie, anything to add? Or? Uh, yeah, sure, I, I think that, you know, focusing on the complexity side of things, right, it's, it's um, you know, every, in, in tech, the natural evolution of any tech is, is kind of an ab abstraction, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, Windows is an abstraction on DOS, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and that, that's just how, how tech evolves, is things get a little bit easier uh, over time. And so when, when we think about the, the puzzles that people try to put together sometimes with these applications, so it needs to touch pieces over here and over there, you know, how do we provide kind of a healthy abstraction layer to, to simplify that? Um, on the back end side of things, right? People shouldn't have to be experts in AWS anymore. Um, and we, can, we can abstract that and make it easy to, to plug in without basically having to get a you know, PhD in, in Amazon Web Services. Right. Um, and, uh, or if you want to take advantage of the new Google image recognition APIs to do some cool stuff by tying into the camera and, and using OCR or whatever it happens to be, you shouldn't have to go, you know, spend a few months hacking around on that to, to figure it out. It's, it's up to vendors like us to provide abstraction layers on top of that, so it's, it's a lot more drag and drop, a lot mm -hmm. more plug and play. And so that's a lot of, of what we focus on to try to, uh, I think what you say, democratize the, the development or the app building process and make it easier to, to get to the value of the app instead of getting caught up in the weeds. Excellent. So, so Daniel, I have a question for you around how you go to market. I've noticed that Aetherpile has done well in partnering with EMM vendors, and that seems like a very synergistic you know, way to go to market for you. Um, you know, a lot of companies here in this room are using EMM vendors, some are using multiple EMM vendors. Um, but you know, talk a little bit about that partnership. I'm curious to know a little bit more about how you work together and, and how you can you know, add value to you know, those vendors' deployments. Sure, yeah, so at Aetherpel, you know, we're focused around mobile support management and specifically uh, driving this end user support model. Uh, so our product platform and connector framework service that plugs into the back end is synergistic and complementary uh, to EMM solutions. So we have partnerships with the top two EMMs that we are working with today in the market right. with uh, joint customers. We have a partnership we announced with Google uh, a couple months ago. Um, Google previewed our products at Google I.O. last week. So uh, we really um, take into this partnership strategy as our primary channel on the go-to-market side. Um, and what it does is it allows uh, partners like EMMs or even MSPs or resellers to be able to offer a value-added service, so an end-user uh, support model uh, that they can potentially monetize, as well as uh, reducing costs on the back end in case of MSPs and outsourcers. Yeah. So it's a model that, um, for us, that accelerates our, our time to market, uh, achieves uh, scale in our go-to-market strategy, but it's also plays well with the existing landscape of mobility players. Um, and we plug into many of these systems. So if you have an AirWatch or mobile iron system, for example, and you're looking to automate uh, through self-service, um, let's say an MDM profile repush, right, which is a common help desk use case uh, for devices that fall from a managed state to an unmanaged state with an EMM, 
you know, the help desk person might spend you know, 30 minutes on the line with an end user manually going through um, setting up the profile. So that's something that we've automated uh, through a one-click touch within our application, um, and our connector framework service enables that through the back end. So even on the technology side, uh, we're complementary to what uh, the EMMs are doing. Perfect. All right, I want to pivot to legacy applications, right? So everyone has invested, everyone in this room has invested significantly in all their applications. Many of them are going to sit by the, fall by the wayside unless they can be mobilized. Some may not need to be mobilized, right? But I think that's a huge, huge opportunity for companies to kind of re, you know, recapture some of those investments and continue to use those applications and not have to rebuild them from scratch. Um, let's talk a little bit about what you guys are seeing as an opportunity to participate in that um, you know, refactoring, for, for lack of better words. It's a word that's been around for a while to describe this activity of you know, recomposing an application. I'd like to hear from each of you about how you kind of can help a company in that regard, because I think it's a very valuable service that you can offer. Yeah, so th this, is, uh, this is really the nirvana of being able to reuse or repurpose some of the existing millions of code and business logic and integrations that quite frankly are running the majority of the companies today. I had a meeting with the CIO of a very large uh, clothing manufacturer and he says I have a billion dollar supply chain that uh, I can't hire any millennials to use. And, and he kind of captured the problem in its essence. It's working, it's a billion dollar supply chain, uh, manufacturing is great but it's clunky on the UI and it, it's not intuitive and it takes too long and quite frankly, we're not, we're not consumerizing the front end. So this is where we uniquely have taken uh, machine learning as a approach to help automate uh, the decomposition of these applications so that we can speed up the requirement gathering, the design, basically keep a lot of the good and then distill the parts that need to be redone um, we can do this for any type of application, whether it's uh, Windows, web, uh, off the shelf, or, or uh, custom. And it really allows organizations to take a look at their portfolio and not have rewrite be the only option or, or staying with what they got. They basically build a new uh, UI layer that front ends uh, many of these applications. Uh, some of the applications will be uh, terminated, let's say, in two years, three years. It gives them the opportunity to actually get the front end done and then replace the back end. Uh, some of the applications will never go away. And you know, a good example, everyday example of who's done this really well are the airlines. If you look at uh, the American Airlines app or the United app, they didn't go get rid of all their reservation systems or their loyalty program system. What they did was built a very intuitive front end that interfaces with those systems on the back end. And more and more organizations are looking at this as a very pragmatic, practical approach. Uh, it's just that you need, you need tools to be able to do that. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything you're saying. And, and essentially, um, it goes back to the whole concept of micro-innovation and deciding you know, what really matters from the consumerization of the front end and what are the few things that you can you can pick off and say, you know what, I need to access the back end to do certain things. Can I create a secure channel to do that? And then consumerize the front end to make the, make the product or the process more usable for my employees and my end customers. So essentially what we do is also kind of pick apart the architecture, help organizations identify a few small wins, and, and then start to build the applications that allow them to still use all of the, all of the investment that they've already made. Um, <clears throat> so we've gotten really familiar with, I would say, an awful lot of really, really old software. <laughs> okay, databases, things from Oracle, things from IBM, things from PeopleSoft, SAP, all that, Salesforce. But the thing that really works is, you know, we don't take apart the, quote, old application running on a PC or something. Uh, but what we do, you know, do provide is, you know, you're able to click on, hey, this is the, quote, data source, the URL or the IP address. Um, and what the tool does, and the automation part is really key, right, because you've got people trying to develop apps which, you know, th they didn't go write the original code. Um, and, and so it basically queries and discovers, right, what's actually available there. And then once that kind of template's discovered, uh, that's when you're doing the mapping of, oh, this part of the data I want in this form. And, and then you can also just drag a drop point, uh, rename, massage, whatever else but make the old systems, the old data, actually useful, even in the mobile case. 
because it's really not a case of, hey, I've got this app that was on a laptop or a terminal. Sometimes it's a terminal, right? Um, and I'd like to kind of create a mobile version of that. It's, it's a whole different experience. You know, the millennials don't want the whole set of screens and everything to fill in and the whole process. You know, they want, hey, my job is to do this, so I want to go click, 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 and I'm done, right? And it all has to integrate back into the whole flow. Yep. Uh, but you really do need a platform. You need a solution where you can create the individual pieces as apps that you can manage and, and really roll out you know, across the different use cases. And that's what we found to be much, much more productive for our customers. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that um, your comment about millennials is interesting. I mean, they're, they're definitely uh, going to be a big influence on... I have two of them. And, well, <laughs> you know then. Yeah, I know very well. Um, so. there's some, I think something like... 34% of millennials expect to work flex time. Right. Um, just under that, uh, prefer to collaborate online. Um, and you know, so, you know, close to 50% expect to use their personal devices uh, for work. So you know, they're pushing us quickly to reevaluate these legacy applications. And I think that's what's going to overcome the app gap, right? Is it's people are going to be coming into your, your organization saying they want more access, they want more access to applications. They want to be able to do their jobs better, more efficiently, right? I mean, that's really what's going to get people to move past email quick, more quickly. But, but I think, you know, one, one, you know, we're coming up on the top of the hour and running out of time, but, you know, one thing I think is really interesting is this, this kind of constant um, best of breed versus the sweet, um, you know, who wins, right? So if you're Bill McDermott or, or Larry Ellison or you, you, you say the sweet always wins, right? Um, and, and, you know, the suite does often win, right? But companies, in, when the suite does win, um, companies aren't necessarily getting all the benefits they could be getting, all the innovation they could be getting, right? So that's why there's these huge partner ecosystems around vendors like SAP and Oracle. You guys can add value. But, but what I see happening in the market is, um, you know, these companies are going to start to acquire companies like yours. They already have in, in pockets, right? And they're innovating internally. They're starting to develop some of the functionality that you guys are innovating on. So what do you guys think you need to do for longevity? How can you not just become just a feature or a product company, uh, or a feature rather, and, and really add value and, and, and create sustainable businesses? Because you're all pretty young companies. Mm -hmm. Like to, you know, just, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough question, but I don't you know, how do you? I don't think it's a tough question. I think Good. you need to make decisions around how to build a company that's built to last. Okay. Companies don't get sold, they get bought. And uh, the value prop, at least for us, is uh, uh, this heterogeneous environment. And basically, uh, mobile experiences, and this is, I, I again, underline experiences rather than mobile devices, uh, really transcend technologies, whether it's that's on the device side, the application side, the data side. So if there are large vendors that care about that, and they're completely unbiased towards whose ERP solution you use, whose device you use, whose data you use, uh, then probably they'll be very interested in, in what we offer. If they're very siloed in one device, one ERP, one solution, quite frankly, that's, that's a very small portion of the problem that we solve. And there is some conflict. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. Sure. The ERP vendors would love for you to upgrade to the latest version of their product which is typically a forklift upgrade of five, six million dollars. Most companies, if the expense reporting system has been coded and built in, don't like to change that, you know, just to get mobile access to these applications. So what we offer oftentimes is a very strong bridge between where they are today and where they want to be. And uh, a lot of the big vendors are not interested in those type of things. They, they rather kind of work on uh, lock-in strategies, whether that's on the platform, uh, et cetera. That's why I'm so excited to see some of the standards work, uh, like the app config work that, that uh, is going on, because it gives the customers uh, choice, and right. it gives vendors like us that, that go into these brownfield environments the ability to plug and play uh, with a number of technologies without feeling like... Uh, uh, we have uh, we don't have uh, upper hand, uh, you know, from the larger vendors. Sure. Yeah, it's it's interesting um, what we're seeing happening in our talking to customers. They're actually looking at us not as a company that they would look to acquire. They're looking at 
this is a company that's built to last right and essentially that's what they're trying to do and internally as well they're trying to adopt technologies that are giving them the flexibility to change their mind as things change things are moving really fast and you know going across this sweet approach you're you're kind of stuck for a long period of time and you're you're deciding that you want to be stuck for a period of time because you want to solve a lot of problems all at once the microservices approach gives you the flexibility to change your mind as, as your needs change, as millennials come up with new ideas. Um, it's essentially what we advise our customers to do is go, go through the microservices approach, have, um, have the ability to um, be flexible with what you want to do over a period of time. And that is the future of how you build applications and deliver applications to your, to your community. You know, there's, there's two, I think there's two aspects to it. One is, you know, to build a company that's going to last and continue to scale. Uh, one is, are you actually solving the, the full problem? Or, or, or are you just doing a bit of the solution? Um, anybody that's just doing a bit of the solution, whether you're a Mad P vendor or um, a, an Embass or even an integration play, if you're any of those things individually, you don't have the full flow all the way from the original data sets and, and services out to the device. Um, you eventually are going to get assumed by something, right? So that's one piece of it. But you know, I think, and we all understand that. We've seen that in, in, in you know, industries all the time. Um, I think the bigger thing is um, creating a company that knows how to do business and does business partnerships very well. So one of the things that we're doing, I think it's different than some of the people who aren't here, but larger companies you all know, um, is you know, we, we don't really drive our own, you know, professional development services, you know, aside, you know, from the product. So, you know, we build the product, we deliver it in the market, we have people we can point you to, we have partners that can do that work, um, but that's not our business, it's not where we generate our revenue from. And, and so we're really reaching out, working with, you know, companies. So some of the companies out, actually, yeah, some of the companies out here, um, they actually have really big service groups that are using our product in their, in their solution, right? And so we license it to the end customer, and it's getting supported by you know some of the larger you know companies to do that, uh, because there's always a little bit potentially a little bit of service, a little bit of development help that kind of goes around it. You know, even though you know you can really accelerate the development process, make it simple, there's still development, and and some people's business is just not IT or at least app development. Sure, no, that makes sense. For us, I think that uh, in my career, I think has been a pattern of smaller companies acquired by larger companies, um, mm -hmm. for, for better or for worse, yeah. um, and sometimes TBD. Uh, but uh, it's 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 not necessarily point versus suite. It's about you know maybe be a point solution, but still deliver a comprehensive solution, um, and without having kind of the baggage that comes along with the suite tag sometimes. Well, it's 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 really about really owning and being that best of breed vendor that has a solution that that sweet vendor may not have or capabilities that sweet vendor doesn't have. I mean, that's the way you can differentiate. Well, relentless innovation right. and delivering that. Right. Yeah, be, be that most valuable player in a market of, you know, that you really own and you really support. Right. And, it, and it's a big enough market that you can make a business out of it continue. But, right. Yeah, that's how we think about it as well, Eric. Yeah, we have a best of breed mobile support management solution for end users and we work with the EMMs and other large software vendors where we're complementary to their solution. We fill a gap in their product portfolio or part of the roadmap. In other cases, we have a broad enough solution where we work directly with customers, but in many cases, it's part of a broader solution that actually benefits the partner, right? Because yep. they have a much stronger portfolio as a result of uh, Apex. Excellent.